<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Me In, colon, a movie podcast, where you didn't really ask for it, but hey, I'm going to give it to you anyways. This is a podcast where we talk about anything, everything, and, well, anything about movies. I'm your host, Chase Lee, and I'm about to spin some shit on you, so let's do so. Let's do so. But first, I want to introduce my guest for this week, and it is uh, my girlfriend. She's back for episode number two. This is her second episode, uh, if you've been keeping up. It's number two. Uh, it is uh, Emmeline. So, Emmeline, say, say hi to the, the peeps out there listening to this. Yo, yo, hello. How's everything going? <laughs> she, she's, she's super excited to uh, come on this episode because we're going to review a movie that we saw last night. And... Um, it's uh you know you know it's, it's it's interesting so we'll get to that portion a little later but first I want to uh, uh, ask how are you guys doing you know I don't want I don't want to be all rude so how, are you guys doing well I, I I haven't I haven't spoken to you guys in a week now so is everything everything okay did someone go to a birthday party this week did someone go to a bookstore and read a book by themselves while drinking some coffee you, you guys need to keep me updated on your lives like I just have no I, I have no clue what you guys what you guys do. Um, all right, so let's start with some uh, trailers that dropped. And unfortunately, there's only one trailer that dropped, and that's worth talking about. Um, and it's the new Fury trailer. Now, uh, for all those people out there that don't know what Fury is, Fury is a war movie. And it's about this um, group of five in, uh, I forgot what era, I think it's World War II, I don't know. Um, I should probably do my research, but it. It's got Brad Pitt, Shia LaBeouf, uh, Michael Pena, uh, Logan Lerman, and I forget what the other guy's name is, but they basically have a tank, and they call it Fury, and they're basically going to face an army of 300 people, and it just it looks really good. It's, it's from the guy that wrote Training Day. It's also the guy that wrote and directed End of Watch from last year, which I really liked. Michael Pena was also in that with Jake Gyllenhaal, and Jake Gyllenhaal was one of those actors that I will... Pretty much watch uh, anything with him, but he was especially really good in that, and their chemistry was really well done. And I think what we're going to see in Fury is that fantastic chemistry between all five of those actors. Um, it just this trailer like completely just it elevated the first trailer. The first trailer was cool. I want to see this movie, but like the second trailer was just like, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna like uh, force you to buy money. Or uh, forced to buy a ticket uh, with this, so yeah, I want to throw my money at this movie. Um, uh, Emmeline, do you do you like uh, war movies at all? Like, do you do you like uh, war war movies? Um, yeah. I mean, the one that comes to my mind right off the bat is Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, that Saving Private really, Ryan's good. Really like that one. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, Saving Private Ryan's one of those ones that's fantastic. Uh, my. My other favorite one is uh, Schindler's List. Um, I'm a huge sucker. Like I know it's not focusing on the war, but it's still the Holocaust, and the Holocaust is still a part of it. Um, I'm a huge like World War II person. Like I, I love anything about it. Like yeah, it was a shitty time in history, but you know, as humans, like they haven't been born yet, you want to educate them on what happened and stuff, so we don't you know do this again. And Schindler's List is just one of those movies that. It makes you feel bad as a human race. You're just like this. We let this happen, type thing. And Fury is the same way. Like it just it feels like it's gonna be one of those um, really good war movies that like you're gonna feel for these characters, and someone's gonna probably bite the dust. Let's be real. There's no spoilers here. It's a fucking war movie, folks. Someone's gonna bite the dust. And so I think we're gonna really like feel connected to these characters so when someone does die it's gonna really hit and I think that's what this movie's gonna be it's gonna be very emotional it looks awesome cannot wait for it so that is the trailer that dropped this week uh, hopefully new trailers will drop next week so I don't have just one to talk about uh, so let's move on to some movie news Emmeline that sound pretty good sure. um, so there's a lot of stuff that dropped this week and uh, first I gotta start with the obvious one and that was that the Batmobile was posted on Zack Snyder's Twitter account. And for all those people out there, Zack Snyder is the director of Man of Steel, and he's also the director of Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. So the whole story behind this is, like, someone posted, like, a shitty, like, 
behind the scenes photo of the Batmobile and it was like at this weird angle where we saw like the ass of the Batmobile and it was just like the back of it and like the, we didn't really see much. So Zack Snyder was like, hey fuckers, I'm going to post a really good one, actually have good lighting and a good camera and I'm going to post a great representation of the Batmobile instead of that 13 year old skater punk probably eating a burrito and drinking Mountain Dew probably took the picture on the side of the sidewalk and then posted on Twitter like he was the hot shit. So Zack Snyder posted um, a really good one, and Emily, I want to get I want to get your take on it. What, what do you like? Do you like the look of it? Like, could, do you do you have you seen the um, uh, the one from Batman Begins and like the Dark Knight and the Dark Knight Rises? Did you watch those movies? Oh uh, yeah, it's been quite a while though. Do Do you remember the the Batmobile slash Tumblr in that one? Yeah. I mean, I think this one, this one looks super badass, and it's a mean fighting machine for sure. Yeah, it looks, oh my god, it looks like you could literally hurl a bazooka at it. Like, you could shoot a huge missile at this thing, and it probably wouldn't even budge. It'd probably bounce off and hit you in the face. So, the one thing that, like, people are really bitching about is the fact that there's guns on the front of the, the Batmobile. And you can clearly see them in the pictures, and, yeah, exactly. The face that Emmeline just made, like, a, like a, a why are they bitching about it, is because Batman does not kill people. So why does he have guns on it? Listen, folks, why do we have to jump to the conclusion that they are there to murder people? What if they're there as, like, a scare tactic? What if he never fires them? What if he never loads them? What if they are there to simply scare the shit out of the villains? What if they shoot, um, those rubber bullets that... Sometimes uh, uh, police officers used, you know, to kind of take someone down but not really kill them. So, I mean, just because there's guns on there does not mean he's going to kill people. So, let's calm down. We're going to take off your panties that are in a bunch. And we're going to go wash them. And then you're going to put them back on. And then you're going to put some logic in your head going, hey, you know what? Maybe they're on there not to kill people but for, you know, something else that's not killing Yes, Batman does not kill people. He probably will not murder people in this one. It's probably there as a scare tactic. I mean, like, Emily, when you see guns on the Batmobile, and part of Batman's lore is that he does not kill people, like, does it bother you that there's guns on the Batmobile? I don't know. I mean, the first thing that came to my mind was, like, gas. Like, it would launch... See? Exactly. It could, it could launch, like, a... a uh, one of those gas bombs or whatever. Like, seriously, it could be there for anything. So, ladies and gentlemen, they're freaking the fuck out. Like, calm down. Like, but other than that, like, it looks awesome. It looks heavily armored. Like, holy shit, this thing looks heavily armored. Like, and, I don't know, man, I don't even know. Like, Superman might even get his ass kicked with just the Batmobile. And that's another thing. The guns could shoot out kryptonite bullets. Which is something Batman needs to take down Superman. So once again, there's other stuff he could shoot out besides bullets to kill random bystanders. So just calm down. But yes, it looks awesome. looks heavily armored. I can't wait to see it. It's one of my most anticipated for 2016. But, you know, it's a year and a half away, so enough talking about that movie. Moving on. Alright, so Emily and I saw 22 Jump Street when it came out. And we really enjoyed it. It was one of those movies that was really really funny and you know it was playing it was playing against itself and it was basically making fun of itself and play along with the fact that it is a sequel to a reboot and it worked the way it was written it, it was just so witty it was clever uh, Tatum and Hill are like their chemistry is off the wall in this one as well it's awesome now if you saw the movie at the end of the movie during the credits there was like a little, you know, comedy tease for future 20 or, or yeah, 20 something jump streets, which were like just fake movies, but they were funny. Okay. Now there's a report going around that 23 jump street is being made, but here's the kicker. The directors of the first two, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, who also did the Lego movie, 21 jump street and Claudia with the chance of meatballs. They are not returning for the third one. I'm not. I'm not going to see it. Like, and it's it's written by a completely different dude. Because they, 
uh, Lord and Miller wrote and directed the first and second one. That's what made them so good is the fact that they, when they write comedy, they hit it all the time out of the park. The fact that there's going to be a different writer in there, and they're, I, I don't even know if they're going to be attached. I don't know if they're going to direct it or just overlook the story. But either, either way, like it's not going to have their print on it. So, Emily, knowing that, because you've seen both of them just like I have, like, are you even excited for the third one now that the the filmmakers from the first two aren't going to even direct it, the third one? I don't know. I have mixed feelings on that. I mean, yeah, it'll be different. I'll have a different feeling, I'm sure, being it's somebody different. Um, but, I mean, I keep thinking back to, like, Harry Potter and how they changed up on some of their stuff throughout the movies, and it ended up being all right. So, I mean, it could go either way. It could, you know, flop or it could be really good. We don't know just yet. Yeah, like, it. she's correct. First two Harry Potters, directed by Christopher Columbus, they looked like children's movies that they felt like they would, could be at a Chuck E. Cheese or something. They were just that colorful and that kitty. The third one was directed by Alfonso Cuaron, who did Gravity. That thing went into a completely darker tone, and it was awesome. Like, the third Harry Potter onward, it just got better and better. Fourth one was directed by someone's name that I completely forgot. And then 5, 6, 7, and 7, uh, part 2, were directed by David Yates. So, it is possible to make a good movie without the same director. I, I'm not saying it's it's going to be a bad movie. It could be the it could be better than the first two, who knows? But I think without the involvement of Lord and Miller, it kind of lessens my enthusiasm enthusiasm just a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. like I'll probably see it, but <sighs> right now I really don't want to. But if the trailer is funny, I will see it. Like it, the trailer is what ultimately will win me over. If it looks funny, I will I will go see it. But right now I'm just not that enthusiastic about it but uh phil lord and christopher miller if you're ever listening to this please for the love of god go direct the third one please just make a nice little trilogy package it into a little trilogy and uh they'll reboot 21 jump street in like five years all right so that's the second piece of news the third piece of news is (laughs) this was a fun one so ted 2 is coming and if, if you guys have been listening to me the first Ted that came out in 2012, that was by far my favorite comedy of that year. Because 21 Jump Street came out that year as well. And people went 21 Jump Street over Ted. I thought about it for a while. Ted goes slightly over 21 Jump Street. It's just, it's a fun, raunchy time with a teddy bear voiced by Seth MacFarlane. You, entertainment doesn't even get better than that. So for Ted 2, a story that dropped this week, Morgan Freeman is... <laughs> It's going to be in Ted 2. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to this. You know why? Because anything that comes out of that man's mouth is going to be raunchy in this movie. And his voice is just going to make it ten times funnier. Can you imagine? Like, I'm going to try a, a Morgan Freeman impression. impression. So, uh, I, if your ears bleed, I apologize. Uh, hopefully, they won't bleed that much. So, it'd be kind of like this. Like, Can you imagine like uh, Ted going... Hey, Marky Mark, what the fuck are you doing? And, you know, Mark Wahlberg was like, Hey, Ted, what are you doing over there? Hey, why don't you come over here, okay? Hey, Morgan Freeman, you like being in Ted too? And then um, he'd be like, I'm Morgan Freeman. Uh, dick, dick balls. Dick balls, dick. Um, fart joke here. Dick joke here. I'm Morgan Freeman. That was terrible, but <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Um, Morgan Freeman will tell dick and fart jokes and it will be the classiest delivery of a dick and fart joke of all time. Trust me. So, uh, Emeline, did you did you see the first Ted? Um, I think I saw bits and pieces of it. I don't think I saw the whole, whole thing all the way through. Oh, it sounds like we have a date night coming. Uh, <laughs> it trust me. It's it's one of those movies that like it's just a good fun time, you know? Because it's a raunchy teddy bear. Who doesn't want to see that? Um. Would you would you would you see Ted Two now that Morgan Freeman? I'm Morgan Freeman. It, sorry guys, it doesn't get any better. My impression still sucks. Uh, would you see Ted Two if um, Morgan Freeman is in it now? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I heard a serious voice say something off the wall funny. 
I would not be able to keep a straight face at all. <laughs> yeah. That's the bust out laughter that I would probably have to do. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> – I'm just thinking about it now. Can you imagine, like, even if, like, uh, Morgan plays, like, a librarian or, like, a, a truck stop person or, like, just an absurd role, and he just walks on the screen and just like, what the fuck shit is this? Dick balls, I am Morgan Freeman. Like, I'm sorry, guys. Like, that's my third attempt. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to RIP my Morgan Freeman impression on this show. I will never do it again. But as always, you guys know that I have uh, several under um, my sleeve that I can do. Like, you know, hey, how's it going, everyone? It's my Mark Wahlberg here. Reel me in, call a movie podcast. What the fuck is this? This sounds fucking terrible. I'm going to go spend my day doing something else, like taking a shit or staring at a wall. Hey, thanks, Mark. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, so you guys know I have uh, many more impressions under that, but Morgan Freeman joining Ted 2? <laughs> Fuck yes. Like, I'm totally on board for that. Even if it's a small role, I will totally crack up whatever comes out of that man's mouth. Seth MacFarlane's humor and Morgan Freeman equals awesome sequel. So, the last piece of news. This is really interesting. Um, Emmeline, uh, yeah, this is way before we met, but like, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 came out at the beginning of May, and me and my roommates saw it, and, you know, one of my roommates really liked it a lot, and two of them really liked it, and I I was kind of, like, on the fence. I liked a lot of aspects of it. I I don't... Did a review on this podcast? I probably did. But if you heard me, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. I really liked aspects of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I love the Gwen Stacy and Peter Parker relationship. I think Emma Stone and Andrew Garfield have great chemistry on screen, but that's also the fact that they're fucking off screen um, since they're a real couple in real life. So it makes sense that they have would have great chemistry. I love that aspect. I even liked the action sequences. I liked most of the villains. I think the, the biggest problem I had, and this is why they postponed you know, this franchise and everything else uh, after number two, is that the villains felt rushed. It felt like I was watching Spider-Man 3 all over again. And Spider-Man 3 was, um, like, butt cancer. That's what it was. And it, it just, it wasn't, it just wasn't good. They rushed all the villains. They crammed a lot of shit in there. And that's exactly what they did with the second one. You figure they would have learned their lesson and not create butt cancer, but create, like, you know, something good. Something that you can watch and enjoy. Okay, so... While I was watching Amazing Spider-Man 2, I realized that the movie fell off. I didn't know what it was, but then when I was thinking about it after I saw the movie, it was the fact that everything seemed jumbled. Everything seemed like it was very, like, something would happen, and then the next scene, something else would happen, but it would completely, like, it didn't flow well. That's the better word. It did not flow well. It was just a bunch of scenes put together. So the story is, Andrew Garfield, you know, he's got to play Spider-Man, he basically said uh, in a quote that Amazing Spider-Man 2 failed, not really failed, but like when he got the script for the movie, he saw something completely different. It read really well, and then the final product had a lot of stuff taken out. I guarantee you there was a longer director's cut somewhere, and Sony stepped in and took a lot of stuff out. Now listen, I don't run a studio. But I do know that they are there to make money, and they have to make choices on what they want to deliver in the theater to make the most profit. I understand that. But if you have a director's cut, or if you have like a longer cut with more stuff in it, and it makes sense, keep it. If it doesn't make sense, take it out. As long as you make a good movie, it doesn't matter. But what Andrew is saying is that it read really well on the script, but the studio took a lot of stuff out, and that's why a lot of people hate it, is that it didn't really flow well that that through line that Andrew loved about the script was gone. Now, should he be kind of bashing the studio that's making him Spider-Man right now? Probably not. But at the same time, there was a lot of people that hated this movie. It is nice to know that the script read a whole lot better than the movie and that there was a lot more stuff that was shot. And I really wish they would release a director's cut of Amazing Spider-Man 2. I've always said that. So... I don't know, Emily. What, what do you think about this? Like, do you do you think Andrew should have said that about the studio, or do you think he should have just kept his mouth shut and just continued on with the franchise? And like, what do you think? Do you think he should have said all that? 
Does it does it hurt his chances for future Spider Man movies? Like, you know, maybe like they'll kind of just do like the storyline with him and then like kick him out or whatever. Or like, I mean, do, okay, like if, if you were hired as a, on as for a studio as a superhero and you kind of spoke out against your movie like that, like, do you think that would really uh, help your career at all? I don't know. I know you'd probably be at odds with the director and all of that. Um, I don't know. That'd, that'd be kind of not really drawing the line, but like pushing the limits because you're not sure like if the director's going to like what you say or not. I mean, it's, there, it's probably ultimately their choice as to like who they have in their movie. Yeah. So if you yeah. voice against it too much, then they might just say, okay, well, if you don't agree with what we're doing here, then get out of here. It, we'll find somebody else. I mean, that's true. And, like, Andrew signed a contract, so I think he's all the way up until Spider-Man 3. But with these comments, I wouldn't be surprised if they kicked him out after 3. Uh, mm-hmm. But, I mean, like, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. Like, I honestly don't know if he was in the right or wrong. Me, personally, like, I, I just think he should have just kept his mouth shut. If he's well aware that it read differently and the movie is completely different, that's fine. Take the hit, be a man, suck it up, and just do the third one and just make it better. And, you know, just hopefully that, yeah, the third one's better. But as of right now, it doesn't really help your cause that you're bashing your own movie like that. We all know it had problems. You don't have to reiterate it, I guess. All right, so that is the uh, movie news uh, section and the trailer section. For this podcast, uh, if you want to comment on any of the news stories or uh, the Fury trailer, comment in that place or upload my voice and let me know. And um, th- this is it, folks. This is the meaty portion of the podcast. We're going to talk about No Good Deed. Now, Emily and I saw this last night, and it's kind of fresh in our minds, but when it was over with, we kind of had like mixed reactions about it. But that's what's good, is that we're going to have different opinions because who the fuck wants to listen to two people agree? No one. So, um, ladies first, in line. Uh, wh- what what did you like about No Good Deed? Hmm. Well, the, what I liked the most was, I guess, the fighting back throughout. Um, I mean, the fact that she wasn't submissive. The, the entire time was great. Like if I were to be in this type of movie, I would want to fight back as much as possible. And even in real life, you know, if if something similar to that situation happened to me, I would want to go down fighting, even if that was it. And, you know, you know, it was the end of me. I would still go out fighting. And you're, you're a, what she's talking about is uh, the main character in the movie that's being terrorized by Idris Elba's character. Uh, so I just wanted to let people know what you're talking about. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. I commend her on that, like, as far as, you know, fighting back against him. Um, and I honestly think that they played, you know, the characters well. Even if, you know, the... Was it the the wording and stuff like that wasn't all that strong? The dialogue. Uh, the dialogue, yeah. yes. Even though that wasn't very strong, like the the reactions and the interactions between the two and the main two, um, that was really done done well, in my opinion. Okay. Um, uh, this is actually going to shock Emmeline because what I told her last night is that. I didn't really care for the movie. I sat on the movie, and I thought about it. Ladies and gentlemen of the internet, I'm going to go against the grain of 12% on No Good Deed. I don't think this movie's rotten. Now, keep in mind, I don't think this is a good movie, but it is not a bad movie. The more I thought about it, the more I actually liked it. As an entertaining piece, it's entertaining. As a... As an acting piece, I think Idris Elba and Taraji P. Henson, that's her name, I probably fucked that up. Either way, those two are the main people that you concentrate on this movie. 
they are incredible in this movie. Like, what's insane is that this script is written by a third grader. I'm not going to lie. It's written by a third grader. There's some dumb-ass dialogue in this movie. But Idris Elba and Taraji P. Henson, they take what they're given and they they kind of, you know, bring their A-game to it. And I think that's what's really great about this movie is the acting. I always love Idris Elba. But the fact that he plays a fucking creeper in this and he's like uh, basically stalking people throughout this entire movie, it's, it's just amazing to watch because you've never seen him act, uh, be a bad guy before. So to see Idris Elba, like, just completely be that creepy guy at the park with the trench coat, it's just it's just amazing to watch. And so that's what I really liked about it. I actually do like the story. It's a very simple story. Like, when you watch this movie and the twist, the plot twist happens at the end, you're... Which is good. Okay, so Emmeline liked the plot twist. I It was fine. It wasn't anything that was mind-blowing, but yes, it was something that kind of took you back just for a little bit like, oh, well, that's that's interesting. It kind of changes why everything's happening. So, I mean, the plot twist was fine. It It's nothing, like, too spectacular, but I thought, like, overall, the, it was entertaining. The acting was good. I thought it was super violent for a PG-13 movie. Holy shit, like, Idris Elba fucking... He does some brutal stuff in this. And like for a PG-13 movie with blood and stuff, I was actually pretty shocked that they got away with a lot of stuff. And, um, I didn't know it was PG-13. I thought it was R. <laughs> you thought we were seeing an R-rated movie? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, sorry to drop the bombshell on you, but we were watching a PG-13 movie. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. see, in line shock too because it is that it is very violent. It's what... It's a very one of the most violent PG thirteen movies I've ever seen, and li- guys, listen, this is not an Oscar worthy movie. It's not even a movie to be in the conversation of hey, that was a good movie. This was an entertaining movie, and I don't think it deserves twelve percent of Rotten Tomatoes. I think it der- deserves at least a sixty. I wouldn't go any fresher than a sixty. Sixty is like the bare minimum of a sixty. I think sixty is fine because what's interesting about this movie is e- uh, Elba's character. I think he really inhabits like this psychomaniac, this uh, narcissist. Like, it's it's almost like a character study. Now, listen, it's not like a in depth character study, but it is. It's like watching an animal. Wouldn't you agree? Like, it was like watching like a caged animal, like kind of just uh, uh, go off the walls and kind of see what what he's thinking. And so, I, I you know what? Listen, <laughs> maybe it was because. I enjoyed myself and it was I was entertained by it, but I I really enjoyed it and like those are the aspects I really liked. I really liked uh, the acting. I think the story's fine. I actually like the way it's shot. The tension's really good. The sound design is really good in this. Like it it really does like keep you on edge in a couple of scenes. So you, you know like <laughs> damn me internet like throw a pitchfork at me and burn me at the stakes. I actually really like this movie. Am I gonna buy it on Blu-ray? Fuck no. Am I going to recommend to people? Probably not. But you know what? I enjoy myself. Sue me. So, uh, Emmeline, now you and I know it's not a perfect movie, but like, what, what did you not like about it? Like, what, what were like the few things that like, like, I know you enjoyed it and I enjoyed it, but like, you and I discussed some things that were like very obvious that were on the negative side. So, uh, what did you think was negative about it? Well, I always, you know, thought that she was being way too trusting with a stranger. She did not know from anybody. And, you know, even even towards the beginning of the movie when he, like, escapes, that, to me, like, the officers were overly trusting, too. So, I mean, it just it seemed like a lot of the characters, well, quite a few of the characters, I should say, were overly trusting and they weren't on guard like I thought they should be. Yeah. Like in today's society, I mean, I think we're more on guard now because not not only just movies but documentaries and stuff like that over crime. You know, people are more on guard now. They're not as trusting, um, especially the younger generation. I don't think they're as trusting, possibly, but 
I mean, the, there's other aspects that come into play too. So, but, um, and then I also did not agree with her <laughs> readily giving information that should not have been shared. That was that really dumb. That me off. It was so dumb. Um, dumb move. Uh, dumb. Yeah, um, are, are uh, anything else that kind of bothered you, or was that mainly it? Um, no, I was just overly trusting and basically giving info, too much info. It just did not sit well with me at all. And believe it or not, folks, I'm actually going to agree with her. The points that she just said are exactly why I do not like this movie, and the fact that the dialogue is fucking dumb sometimes. Um... Yeah. This isn't a spoiler anything. If you've seen the trailer, you know what this movie's going to be. Idris Elba goes to a house, and he terrorizes a family. And that's all I'm going to say. But when he gets to the house, her character is like, Oh, my husband's not home. My kids are here. I'm all alone. My money's in the basement. I have a gold car in the, the garage. Like, she basically... That, that's not true. But I mean, like, you get my point. Like, she basically releases a bunch of information to this this random person and he's just like okay cool let me borrow your phone it's like really you just spoon fed all your information to this psychopath good job oh and um uh yeah the one thing that really struck me is that she is this dumb to do that and what was her occupation in the movie i can't remember it was a homicidal lawyer no, she was a prosecutor, and has something having to do with the homicidal unit or something like that. I mean, she it seemed like she had, like, two different things going on. She was probably uh, working for a homicidal unit against, um, what is it, a crimes against women, women or something like that. Which is weird, because yeah. if, you, if you are acknowledged... What psychopaths that abuse women are like, if you can pick up on signals, anything. Idris Elba in the movie beats women. He is a woman beater. And you're telling me that there's this random guy at your door and you just start spilling this information. Like... <sighs> and... You should know fact, better, <laughs> basically. And the fact that supposedly... It tells us in the, the beginning that he's, like, statewide. He's known. Exactly. You know, it is widely publicized about the crimes that he was supposedly committing against the women. And for her to not know, and she was a former prosecutor, that, that kind of didn't sit well with me either. I'm like, how did you not know? Even with watching the news, you would probably know something like that. Yeah, no, it's, it's dumb. Like, th those aspects... And the dialogue are what really got me. It's like, you could have been a smart movie. You really could have. You could have been this, like, you know, very smart dialogue in this suspenseful thriller. You could have been that with a very basic story, and it would have seemed awesome. And the other aspect I hated about it was Leslie Bibb's character. She was the uh, friend of the wife, and she was basically a whore. Um, basically, the movie's called No Good Deed. I have come to the conclusion that everyone except for the main character was an a-hole. <laughs> they, like, did bad stuff. And, like, she would, she didn't consider to be doing anything bad. She was just was a whore and she was very open about it. Um, there was one line where she was like, yeah, you know, um, I treat my guys like going to the gym. You know, I go, or, no, I, like, having, she, sorry, I screwed up. She's like, uh, she was talking about sex. She was like, yeah, I treat sex like going to the gym. You know, I, I go, I try to do it once a day and I don't use the same equipment twice. Really? You basically just said that you like to have multiple penises in a day. Good job. Um, I hated her character. I She was, she was nothing but penis hungry throughout the entire movie. She gets into the house and she's just like, oh, I thought we were going to have a girl's night. We're going to drink some more. Oh, who is this? And she's like, oh, it's this creepy motherfucker that I brought into my house. He probably is, uh, touch my kid right now and she's like "Ooh, let me uh are you single yeah let me let me touch your face like let's go upstairs let's have some bear rug sex i don't know like she was just 
she was just penis hungry throughout the entire thing. Her character was pointless. Her character was pointless. Except for the one fact where, like, she talks to him and, like, it kind of stumbles him. But, like, other than that, she just talks about dick throughout the entire thing. Leslie Bibb, I think you're a great actress. I think you're funny. But no, just stop it. Okay. Anyways, off of that little tangent. Um, so those are many of the aspects that I hated. I enjoy it for the most part. I think the acting is better than the script. Um, and the, the plot twist is fine. It's nothing spectacular. Emmeline liked it more than me. So I'm going to ask her, what would you get it, give it out of a 10? Uh, well, if I could split the movie in half, <laughs> the first half would be probably a four or five. And then the second half, I would say maybe a seven. Okay. So, I don't know, I guess all together it might be a six, 6.5, something like that. Okay. Um, I will, like I said, uh, if I was to rate it on Rotten Tomatoes, I would give it a 60 and not a 59 where it's rotten. So, I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to split it right down the middle. I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10. Uh, so, uh, average, both of our scores, it's a 5.5 out of 10. Listen. I think you and I both agree it's not the best movie in the world. It's not an Oscar-worthy movie, but it was entertaining. Yeah, it sure got the audience involved. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Our audience was like, I was like, really? Like, people were really into it. So I was like, this is what going to the movies is all about. It's just like everyone enjoying like a good movie and like rooting for everyone. Like, it was pretty fun. I'm not going to lie. That was one of the better experiences I've had in a while because just everyone was into it. So, overall... Real, both of us, average scores, 5.5 out of 10. Not the best movie in the world. Story's okay. She likes the plot twist better than I do. I think the acting's really good. She really likes the acting. The dialogue is dumb. Leslie Bibb's character only wants the dick. And, um, yeah, that's all we have to say. Not as bad as 12%. So take that, Rotten Tomatoes. All right, guys. That brings us to the ending portion of the podcast where we're going to give you the top five box office results for the weekend. I've given Emmeline the five that are in the top five, but I jumbled them up so she has no idea what's the actual order. So Emmeline, she's going to try to guess uh, five through one. So starting with five going up to one, what is your list? What what is the uh, top five for the weekend? Mm, This is really tough for me, but uh, I think... Number five would be Let's Be Cops, being it's been out for a while. Um, and then Dolphin Tail at number four. Dolphin Tail t- number two. Um, and then for number three, No Good Deed. For number two, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And for one, Guardians of the Galaxy again. I'm going to tell you that you got one right. One. One oh. right. Uh, let's just put it this way. Switch one and two with three and four. You would have had a perfect list. All right, guys. Let's give you the top five. Let's Be Cops is at number five with $4.3 million. Its domestic call so far is at $72 million with a worldwide of 94 On a budget of 17 you double that with 34 Guys, this movie made a, a profit, like a huge profit. And I, I interviewed the stars, and I asked them if they were going to do a sequel. What would it be? And like, they're just like, well, if it does well, we, we'd love to come back. 20th Century Fox, make them come back. <laughs> it's a very profitable movie for you. So, Let's Be Cops is number five. What's number four? Turtles is number four with 4.8 million. Its domestic call so far is at 181 with a worldwide total of 319. Its budget is 125. Double that, 250 to break even. This has already made a ton of profit. And the sequel's coming, so you guys know that. Number three. Guardians of the Galaxy with eight million, its domestic haul, which is it's blowing my mind right now, three hundred and five million domestically worldwide. It's got six hundred and eleven million on a produ- production budget of one seventy. Double that, you got three forty. Are you fucking kidding me? This movie has, it, oh my god, it's almost got like three hundred million in profit just on the movie. Like, and oh. Uh, Oh my god. Like, I just jizzed in my pants because I'm so excited for this movie. Like, listen, no one expected this movie to be good or do as good as it has. I expected maybe 100 million. It made almost 100 million opening weekend. 
and it's the highest grossing movie of the year so far. This gamble that Marvel did is got over 300 million domestic. What the shit? That is so awesome. And I love that movie to death. Like, I'm so glad it's doing well. All right. Number two. Dolphin Tale 2. With 16.5 million. Domestic call. Opening weekend, so 16.5. Worldwide's got 17. Its budget's 36. Which is kind of sad because you got to double that. You get 72 to break even. Pfft, it's got a long way to go. I guess no one wanted to see uh, a dolphin with a robotic tail have a, a friend. Uh, that's actually really depressing. All right, so number one, process of elimination, no good deed. Twenty-four point five million on a budget of thirteen million. Double that, twenty-six. It's almost broke even. That's pretty awesome, and I really didn't expect this movie to do well. Like, yeah, we saw it and we paid for it, but like, I didn't expect it to be this high. I expected maybe. I'd say about 15 to 18 million opening weekend, not 24. That's pretty good. And, you know, with its worldwide total or if it, if it keeps going, it's going to it's gonna break even and it can make a little profit. And that's all they want. So, you know, congratulations, No Good Deed. People want to go see you. You see what I'm talking about, Rotten Tomatoes? Just because it's at 12% does not mean shit. People will still go see it. Uh, Transformers 4 is the biggest abomination of that. It's got one of the lowest Rotten uh, Tomatoes scores, and yet it makes over a billion dollars. But if I had to take, if someone had a gun to my head and told me to pick one, I'd pick No Good Deed any day. Um, yeah, so that will do it, folks. That is the box office results for the weekend. Um, and that will also do it for this podcast. Um, if you guys want to comment on any of the stories we've discussed or the trailer that dropped or No Good Deed, if you even saw it, Comment that place is rubble in my voice and let me know. Uh, Emmeline, I want to thank you for uh, coming on again. Uh, hopefully, I'll get to have you on another one sometime in the future. Thank you for having me on. Oh, no problem. And uh, if you guys like Emmeline better than me, that's okay. I totally understand. Uh, she's very pretty, and she's not me. <laughs> that's awful. All right. So, uh, yeah, I want to thank Emmeline for coming on. And... Uh, I'm gonna do a little something different. Like it, if I um, if I get like a tweet from someone talking about the show, I'm gonna give them a shout out, uh, regardless if it's insulting or not, because I love you guys. You guys are my favorite audience in the world. Uh, so, so I get this notification from this guy. Where's he at? All right, all right, brother. I'm gonna call you out. At Zachary Joel 24, so at Z A C H A R Y J O E L 24. He sends me a tweet and he's like, at Real Chase Lee, I listen weekly. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Should, you <laughs> should change intro to I talk about everything poopy, shitty, dildo y, dick balls movies. <laughs> Seth Rogen is my hero. Now, I don't know if you're being sarcastic, <laughs> and if you you hate my opinions, which I'm totally fine, or if like that's meant to be. I don't know. I, what I took from it was I talk about shitty movies all the time, but I love Seth Rogen, and you hate Seth Rogen, and you think his movies are shitty, but I talk about shitty movies, and I think Seth Rogen's my hero. So either way, I love it. Listen, if you guys want to tweet at me um, at Real Chase Lee R E E L Chase Lee, all one word. If you guys want to tweet at me on how much my show sucks or if you like it or if you listen to it, I, I read them all. I like all the comments. So <laughs> send, them, send them my way and you can get a shout out on this beast. So that will do it for this week's episode of Real Me and Colin, a movie podcast. If you want to follow me on Spreaker, you can do just that. Press that follow button and you can listen live. If you want to uh, listen to me on iHeartRadio, I'm also on there. If you guys want to follow me on Twitter, I'll say it again, at Real Chase Lee, R-E-E-L, Chase Lee, all one word. If you guys want to like the Facebook uh, fan page for uh, Real Reviews, which is where I put all my movie reviews and podcasts and stuff, it's uh, www.facebook.com slash Real Reviews with Chase Lee. I post all my stuff on there, uh, all live links, all that stuff, so you can listen to this live. If you guys want to subscribe to my YouTube page where I 
I do movie reviews, short films, web series. I'm doing trailer dubs right now. It's uh, youtube.com slash shabootnik75, capital S, lowercase h-a-b-o-o-t-n-i-k-7-5. And that's it. I think that's all the social media shit. So uh, before I go, I just want to say uh, I appreciate you guys listening. You guys are my favorite. Uh, yeah, just keep on listening, guys. Like, you guys keep me going. Uh, so next week, um, I don't know. Oh, um, next week I'll probably talk about the guest because I actually saw that this past uh, Wednesday. But I was going to save it for next week's podcast because it comes out on the 17th, which means I'll do my podcast that Sunday. So I'll probably talk about the guest and I'll probably talk about uh, the directors and the interview and how it went because I got to interview the director, writer, and actor. I'll probably talk about uh, some other news. and tra- you, guys, you guys know the drill. I pick shit to talk about, and I do it every Sunday. So that will do it, guys. Thanks for listening. Have a good night. Have a good day. Have a good afternoon, evening, night, whenever the fuck you're listening to this thing. I will see you guys on next Sunday for another episode of Really In, colon, a movie podcast. I'm Chase Lee. Peace out. Oh, my.